I want to go on and introduce myself very briefly. I am uh, Karen Jolly from New Orleans, the home of the World Champion Saints. Yeah, yeah there you go. Good. Hey. Um, Crawfish Etouffee, and the always well conceived 24 hour drive through alcoholic daiquiri beverage shop. So, <laughs> you know, something Vegas hasn't caught on to just yet. But um, I'm going to be talking about patient selection here. And, you know, before I even get into the slides, the, the thing is this that, that I want to just go and kind of summarize about patient selection and summarize what it is that I feel is very important for you guys to know. The, the bottom line is this. When we're looking at patient selection, we're essentially looking for the correct indication, making sure that you're using it in the right kind of patient, and then ruling out the wrong kind of indication. And, you know, we'll go into a lot of details about this kind of stuff, but the correct patient indication, just to give you an overview, is refractory neuropathic pain. If you remember nothing else about this, remember the patient you want to do this in has refractory neuropathic-based pain, okay? And who's the wrong patient to do it in? Well, the bottom line is, is that on the other side of it, you want to make sure that the patient has, I guess, the correct psychological profile to undergo this because, quite sincerely, you will be married to the patient. And it doesn't, ver it doesn't mean very much. You know, you've heard it again and again and again, and it doesn't mean very much for that first month or three months or six months, but I promise you that at one year, when that patient's still calling you up, you know what I mean, four times a week, it definitely, definitely means something then. So again, make sure you go and know the correct patient to include, and then how you go and generally exclude this. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started over here. Um, success, what defines as actual success? Well, success is defined by making sure that you have the right thing in. You're never going to go and get anything good out unless you actually put something good in there. And you have to spend a little bit of time on this. I mean, whether it's through patient counseling and education, or whether it's through just making sure that you know about the trial and that you have a way to go and explain the actual um, techniques of it there to the patient, I think that it's exceptionally important to make sure that you're putting in the correct kind of patient for the, for the indication. You do have to go and adhere to strict aseptic technique. Yeah, you have to go and have appropriate use of the equipment and, of course, appropriate follow-up. In my personal practice, what I do is, for my trials, I don't like the, there to be too much scar tissue buildup, so I like to go and see my trials back within approximately four to five days. Um, I don't like them to go over the weekend if ever I can go and avoid it. And after that visit, I'll go and have my implant. After an implant, I do an eight-day post-op visit, a one-month post-op visit, a three-month post-op visit, and then one year thereafter. And the idea is that it kind of follows and makes sure that they're kind of doing good, and once they're doing good, then you don't have to go and follow them as often or only as necessary for complications that may go and develop. So um, this slide over here, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a little over dramatic, I think, but, but the idea is, is that when you have an appropriate patient selection, number one, it may go and develop the actual satisfaction of the patient. And therefore, if a patient is satisfied, then your staff becomes satisfied, and then your implanter becomes satisfied, and eventually, it trickles down to referring physicians that are obviously satisfying, and it builds up more and more of a referral base, and then the last line ultimately may determine the success and failure of a practice. It's, it's that important, right? But really, it does go and kind of trickle down. So you want to make sure that you're using the right kind of patients in, because eventually, if you're known as the person that's not, or if you start off with some very complicated cases to start off your practice and do the spinal cord stimulation with, you'll be known as the one that doesn't get the successful patients. Whereas competitors that may or may not have been doing this for a while, if they're starting off with those grand slam home run type of patients, they're going to be known as the person that really kind of gets the results. So you want to be that kind of person. Um, what is it going to depend on? Well, obviously diagnosis. And I kind of alluded to that a little bit over there. You need to make sure that you go and feel more conservative therapy. Spinal cord stimulation is not a first-line therapy. It's certainly indicated for people that are refractory to more um, to other types of modalities. You need to make sure that the their coexisting diseases don't go and actually interfere with anything. And then, of course, that the patient has the mental capacity and the correct motivation for the actual device itself. And we'll go into a little bit more detail into each of those things. 
What's involved in the diagnosis? Well, we kind of alluded to that a little bit already through the anatomy lecture, but the bottom line is, is that you need to go to whatever kind of test you need. MRI, certainly within the scope of practice, to go and develop a